So if we could start with your full name, sir. My full name is uh, Natibida B. Carbajal. Where's that paper? You can get the name. The whole name is N-A-T-I-N-A-N-A-V-I-G-A-D. Natividad. And the last name, the middle initial is B. My, my mother's maiden name, B. Barunda. But uh, my last name is Carbajal. C-A-R. You probably already got that name down there. Uh, if you could spell it for me, that'd be great. Yeah. Carbajal is C-A-R-B-A-J-A-L. Perfect. And when and where were you born? I was born in Anthony, New Mexico. It's a little town about 20 miles from El Paso. Right on the state line, Texas and New Mexico. And then the other town is closer than is in New Mexico, Las Cruces, New Mexico. There are El Paso and Las Cruces are right in the middle. And what is your birthday? My birthday is uh, I was born 1926. 1926. And what day, what month, and what day? February the 8th. So, how old are you currently? Right now? I guess how old. 91. <laughs> she already told you about that. <laughs> 91 years old. Can you imagine that? Never thought I was going to get that close. And then uh, I, was, I, was, uh, I was only 17 when I joined the service. And which, yeah. which branch of the military did you serve in? Uh, I started with the Army, the regular Army. And were you drafted or, or did you no, enlist? No, I, I joined the Air Force, the Airborne afterwards. But were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. I, I volunteered. Okay. Uh, I volunteered. I went to a, a town by the name of El Paso, Texas, which is 20 miles from my town, uh, the state line. And which units were you attached to? Oh, God. I was attached to the... Yeah, well, I started to the Third Army. That's the uh, Third Army, and the first unit was. Then the other unit was the. Uh, I remember the, the 71 Air Division. I was attached to that one. I was attached to the. See, uh, I can remember the rest of the units. Of it. They just. It was um, just a moving along. So you were 100, 101st Airborne. I was 101st Airborne. That's where I stayed longer because I joined I joined the 101st Division when I was in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. And then from there, Fort Benning, Georgia, I moved to uh, St. Louis, I think, St. Louis, Baltimore. And then from there, we trained there in jump training. Then we went to uh, where the airborne was in uh, uh, Camp Chanks. The airborne was there, and that's a port of embarkation right there, nearby there. And then we trained there a little bit, and when we were ready to go overseas, the war was starting, started already. The D-Day was already going on, and uh, we, we uh, boarded the ships in Kemchanks, New York, and uh, from there we went overseas. It took us about, I would say, it took a little over 10 days to get to uh, New England. New England. From England, we went into a, a big field where they had online by U.S. Army equipment. Mm -hmm. That's where we were there, and they separated us to different divisions there. That's why I wind up with the 101st, you know. But we, we, didn't, we didn't go in division. When we went uh, to the battlefronts, we jumped in uh, uh, Bastogne, in, uh, in the Battle of the Belge. We jumped in there, and from there we mostly foot folders. So what was the highest rank that you attained? I only went, I went to corporal, but I lost my stripes. But me and this guy went on a, a little vacation for about a week or so. When he came back, they, they read my corporal. I didn't last very long. Because well, we had all the, the freedom, you know. 
and then me and this guy from he was from Fort, Fort, uh, Springfield, Texas, and then me and him went to town and had some fun over there. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about your childhood and your family growing up. What were your parents' names? My 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 mother's name was uh, name her first name was Ines. Mm -hmm. uh, last name is her last name before she got married to my dad. Her name was Barunda. That's where I got that B there. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, when she married my dad, my dad's name was Marshall, and uh, his last name was Carbajal. And my grandfather is Maximilian. He lived on the other side of town, the same town, but on the, on the Texas side. And I lived on the, my dad was working on the ranch, I told you that ranch where he was running a big ranch there. And uh, he had a lot of illegals and illegal uh, people from Mexico, from, T, from Juarez, Tijuana, they used to come from, from Juarez. Mexico when they come across the border. Some were illegal and some weren't. So, and my dad knew the immigration guys and then because uh, one of the guys grew up with my dad. He was an immigration from El Paso. El Paso was right on the side of Juarez. And uh, the immigration, they go, they go, they go, they drive into that ranch where my dad was working. And then my dad would tell him, what are you guys doing here? There's not nobody legal in here. He said, no, well, we just check it out and see who's legal. And my dad said, no, everybody's got permission to be here. And they didn't, they didn't bother them. They just went through one side and went up. <laughs> so what type of ranch was it? It was like a, a, a car trailer. They had a cotton, they had vegetables, they had a wheat, and uh they had a, what do you call that, a, 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 a vegetable, they had some kind of a, they make the sugar cane out of sugar, sugar cane wheat. And they, they had a cotton, a lot of cotton, they had a lot of a corn, mm -hmm. they had a lot of corn, they had everything in there. It's a big, it was a big ranch. Mm -hmm. And they had big houses, long houses where the illegal used to live there. They had the families there. Some some had permission, some didn't. Mm -hmm. The one that didn't have permission, sometimes they they told them the same guy that had permission told them don't go to town because there was a town right there by the name of Anthony, and there was a town there, the markets and everything. And the, the, the immigration guy used to tell the, the illegal guy. Don't go to town because the immigrations are all over their area there. They're in cars. And the cars were painted like army color, you know. And so some of the guys, they didn't listen. They go over there and they get caught over there and boom, they throw them back to Mexico. And they used to, and the guy that had the permission, they used to tell them, don't go over there. So then the guy that had permission, you get a list of what they wanted. When they went to town, they buy all the stuff and bring it to the guys over here at the ranch. Because mm -hmm. the ranch had a, a big roll of houses with a kitchen, a front room, and a, and a bathroom for the illegals. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy, my dad used to know them all. You know. He used to, my dad was a, he, he used to, when they used to pick cotton, the guy used to pick cotton a lot, and they were good pickers. My dad used to be the one that weighed the cotton for them. Mm -hmm. and then my grandfather used to drive a wagon. They had mules in those days. They had mules, they had those big old wagons full of cotton. My grandfather would take it to the gin, cotton gin. And then, then he leaves it there and bring an empty one. And the guy would fill it up again. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, uh, my dad had us picking cotton to me and my brother. And, uh, <laughs> and my, my dad was uh, he saw me chewing cotton, I said, hey, you know, Mr. Chewing, standing there chewing cotton, and get there and pick some cotton. Well, we just pick a little bit of it, just, just to get, get a few five dollars. They didn't pay too much for that in those days. So did you just have the one brother? No, I had a, I had an oldest brother, but he was, he was in L.A. with my grandmother and, and my grandmother's son. They lived in L.A. My oldest brother was, his name was Manuel. 
and uh, he used to come with my grandmother to L.A. And it was just me and my brother, my second brother, Alfred, his name was Alfred Carvajal. And my youngest brother was named Robert. See, and then Robert, when he grew up, he joined the service and he went to Korea. And Korea was on war in those days. And my, my brother Alfred, the second brother, he didn't, he didn't pass the, the, the... Physical? The, 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 the you know, the... The, the, the physical t- test? Physical test. Pa- he didn't pass. He didn't, he didn't speak very good English because when he used to go to school, he used to go to school there, he, instead of going to school, he'd go play hooky. <laughs> he didn't learn very good English. And he kind of, he used to speak it, he understand it, but he didn't pass that uh, physical so you were the only one of your, your yeah, brothers me, that my, served in... My older brother and my youngest brother, the only one. All three of us. We were four brothers. We were all four brothers. And were you guys close growing up? Yeah, we were all together, except my oldest brother. Yeah. Like I told you, he was so here with my grandmother in L.A. Yeah. And, so uh, he, he, my grandmother used to go back to New Mexico. Mm-hmm. But she, my grandmother had a big house there. And my grandfather was there. And he wouldn't he wouldn't go with her to to L.A. So my grandmother would come to L.A. with my oldest brother, Manuel. His name was Manuel. And uh, he used to like that because my grandmother used to buy him everything. He used to come, he used to come home and bring some clothes for us from coming to New Mexico. We had we had clothes, but I mean we we, had, we wanted new clothes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what would you guys do for fun growing up? We, we we went to school, and when we got our school during uh, vacation school, my dad would take us to the ranch and used to make us work in the ranch. But they used to they used to plant uh, cantaloupes and uh, and watermelons, and uh, my dad used to get us working picking up the vines from the cantaloupe vine, uh, cantaloupe vines, pick them away from the the land the, where the the tractor used to go by there, so they won't step on the vines. Mm-hmm. We pick the vines, put them on top of the plants, and then the big old rose uh, uh, vines. Man, man that was, you got to be bending down. And How old were you when you were doing this? Sure, we were we around 15, 16 years old. Mm-hmm. Just tell you, I was still in school. We, we, didn't, we didn't graduate school until we were about 17, 18. So this was during the Great Depression. Yeah. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about growing up during the Depression? No, we we uh, we talked about. Um, we used to hear my dad talk about it, and uh, my dad wanted to, wanted us to grow up so we can go into the service, and that's what we did. I joined the service when I was 17. My brother Manuel, he uh, the oldest. He joined the service when he was around 18 or 19, mm-hmm. but he went he went into the Air Force. And he was a, a, waist gun, a waist gunner on a B-25 in Japan. Mm-hmm. See? And my youngest brother, he joined, he went into the service when he was 19, I think, because he graduated from school with all the other guys. Mm-hmm. And that's when all the uh, friends of mine went into. They went in, they got called in the service, they got drafted. And my youngest brother got drafted too. So he had to go in the service. And then I said, well, I'm gonna volunteer. Nobody was around no more. My brother was only in the service. Are your brothers still alive? Said my, no, my oldest brother and my youngest brother and my second brother died, they all died. Yeah, my oldest brother died uh, I think he died of a heart attack. He had a bad heart attack. And my young, my second brother died of a heart attack too. And my young, my youngest brother died of diabetes. Mm-hmm. He was the youngest. He left, he left a wife and five, five daughters. And my, my oldest brother left uh, two boys. In fact, one of my youngest, one of his sons. This area here in Moreno Valley somewhere. And the oldest brother died, the oldest son. He had two boys. That was my oldest brother. 
and the, my third brother had uh, two daughters and a, and a boy. Mm -hmm. They're still alive. And they live. They live out there in in L.A. in Figueroa by Figueroa Street. Now, did you have any close friends growing up? And, uh, friends? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I had a lot of friends that went into the service when I went in. They got drafted. Do you remember their names? No. Well, let's see. The name. Uh, well, the name was uh, Amador. Amador Madrid, and uh, the other guy was, uh, uh, shit, I can't forget her name. As soon as I turned 91, I stopped forgetting all kinds of names. Uh, I don't remember most of the names. There was about, oh yeah, one of the guys that grew up with me, his uh, his brother his his brother oldest brother his name was uh, Abel 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 and his youngest brother he went he volunteered they went together but they didn't make it they went into the war and they got killed the four guys four guys that went into the service when I went they but they 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 called them they got drafted they went they went way ahead of me. Because I, I volunteered when I was 43, 43. I, I volunteered in 1943. I was 17. I turned 18 when I was in France. D-Day was already f going full blast. And uh, but those guys went in when the war started, and they were the first ones that got killed. Over there. So they were they were already in for a few years by the time yeah, you. Yeah, they were they weren't they weren't even. Maybe they were there not even a year, but. Maybe a year they they got killed. Yeah. They got killed like they went in like in uh, like I was in in Munich. I was in Nuremberg. But uh, they, when I got there, the the Germans already been chased out of there mm -hmm. by the Americans. See? The Americans were going full blast. They were, they chased them out of France. Cause you know I remember the Germans took over France. They invaded France. But when we landed in France, we had to fight some of the Germans that were left there, and we were in a in a cemetery fighting the Germans, and the bullets were just hitting the they had the, they had the cemetery made out of the marble stones, headstones, the bullets were just clinging, the, and we were hiding behind the stone, and the man it was uh, like hell there. Bullets swimming, all that swinging, making all kinds of noise, machine guns and everything. But they didn't last very long because the Americans went to one side and we were in the cemetery there. And they went and they circled them and they made them run back to Germany. So they all went back to Germany. Hmm. That's when they started hitting all those small towns. So they went after the small town like Poland and Czechoslovakia and they took over all those towns. You know. They can re if they if they would have taken over England. God only knows. I don't think we would have made it in England. So we were we did, we disembarked in England, yeah. and that's where. But the Englands were pretty well equipped too, you know. So they didn't let the Germans get too close. They were see they had a before the 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 English uh, land. The German had right on the line, they had a, a Siegfried line, I don't know if you heard of it. Mm -hmm. They had those big old giant pillars of cement, big white ones, in a line, like a, like a, the white is a highway. They call them dragon's teeth, Yeah, from what I dragon understand. teeth, they used yeah. to call them dragon teeth, we used to call them the Siegfried line. When we got there, well, man, I was, they see the tank was just bouncing and that they won't break them. By the time they do that, the Germans start blowing them, Gun, you know, yeah. but they finally they brought those big, big giant bulldozers with those big old deals that pick up the dirt, and they just wiped them right out. Went right through. The German, the Americans went right across where we were. We were behind those uh, pillars there, ducking the bullets. Mm -hmm. So the Germans, they, they they were running away from 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 France, and they, uh, they left France. 
they, they left quite a few soldiers in France. They were in the buildings, on top of the buildings. When we walked into France, they were shooting at us. We were walking alongside the sidewalk. They were shooting at us. When we were walking along, we stood behind the pillars and the roll of the, the pillars. The guys were in the windows over there shooting. The Germans were shooting at us. They were getting the other guys. I mean, they didn't get a lot of guys shot. But then when the, the guys came over with, uh, with one of those uh, cannons, one of five cannons and wheels and park it like this, started shooting at the windows. It blew the whole top of the, so the, the apartments, blew it all up. Pretty soon you see the Germans coming out of the first floor, out of the back front door, and then the Americans start, <laughs> start machine gun. Mm -hmm. They were still fighting, you know, but they, they were running away because the, the building was about ready to fall. Now, going back a bit before you entered, entered the service, um, you remember Pearl Harbor? Do you remember that day and where you were? And yeah, I was in uh, Pearl Harbor. I was in uh, South Salzburg. I think it was in Salzburg, Germany. And uh, I heard that uh, the, uh, the guys took over uh, Pearl Harbor. The Japanese took over Pearl Harbor, part of it, but then the Americans blew them away out of there too. They did the same thing with the Germans. The Americans uh, chased them out of Pearl Harbor. Yeah. So you must have been in the U.S. at that time. Yeah. They, I remember there was in, in and they found when the I heard of the Japanese invading uh, Pearl Harbor. I was still in, in the United States. Everybody was saying, "Oh, the Japanese took over Pearl Harbor, man." They were taking over Pearl Harbor. Man. Do you remember how that made you feel? Well, we felt like we were going to go to Japan mm -hmm. because that's when the war started for Japan. You know, the Japanese were just, that's where they started. Mm -hmm. They started invading uh, Pearl Harbor first instead of invading uh, uh, San Francisco. Then they started with Pearl Harbor because they, they found that Pearl Harbor was a lot of American soldiers there. Mm -hmm. See, and uh, and then we we said, man, we gonna we gonna be shipped to uh, Japan. No man, we the the, the Germans were going full blast too towards towards France. That's when they took over France and all this stuff. And then separated us. And guys, guys went to Japan. Guys were I got a, a my youngest brother went to the, he went to Japan. My oldest brother was flying over Japan bombing and machine gunning the, the chip boats. And, uh, but I, and I was home when, I got home when uh, my brother was already from the service. Yeah. So the war was over in, in Japan. I mean, the war was over in Germany, and then Japan gave up. Japan was going full blast too, man. They were, they were, they were taking over, they took over all the islands, practically. I see the Americans had a lot of soldiers on those islands. A lot of soldiers in there. You see that, but the, the soldiers weren't, there was no match for those soldiers against the Japanese. The Japanese were coming in in boats and coming in in parachutes and everything. And so that, that, the paratroopers, uh, we had to jump behind the lines and uh, and uh, the jail, the, the, we find we, we find we, we jump behind a line in close to Holland, and the Jap the Ameri the Jap the Germans were inside the the buildings there. They, they used to live there. They start coming to the street and seeing the American jumping in, in the parachute. And they start shooting in the parachuters. A lot of guys jumped and they got killed before they even hit the ground. Yeah. And then, uh, then the artillery started shooting at the planes of C-47s, 46s. They shot the, the wings off the planes and whatever. And then uh, the guys say, don't be hooking up. Don't hook up to your shoot. Just, just crawl out the door and jump on. The guys were crawling out. And so we had to crawl out the window when, when we hit the ground. The guy said we had to crawl out the plane because the plane was going down. 
And they used to crawl and a lot of guys made it and some guys didn't. So the plane crashed, you know. And when they crash, it blows up. Because things were full of gas. You know. So when you volunteered for the Army, yeah. why did you choose the Army? Well, I, I really, I, I wanted to, I wanted, I told it, I wanted to volunteer to go to the Air Force or the Navy. And I said, oh yeah. So they kept writing and saying, uh, kept writing, you know. And then all of a sudden he said, after you finish writing uh, the application there, he said, now you're going, you're going into the Army. You're going to Europe. Europe, I said, I thought I was going to go in the Navy or the, uh, the Air Force. No, he's going in the Army. So I went up in the Army. I went up in the 1st Division, the 1st Division. We started with the 1st Division, Big Red One. And uh, a lot of divisions that I went, I jumped. They kept separating the people, you know. Mm -hmm. All the new guys were going. So put them a certain age. They get so many in a certain area. And oh man, it, it was a madhouse. Kept moving and moving. We didn't even unpack our, our stuff. We, we had a, you know, sooner we go to bed, get up in the morning, bum, let's move. Shoot, man. Where are we going? So we're going to certain certain town or certain place, certain battle zone. So where did you... Uh, where did you do your your basic training? Uh, what I did, I was I did a lot of training with guns and. Where where was oh, it though? I was in. Uh, when I first went into El Paso, uh, they took me, they took me to Fort Bliss, Texas. I trained in Fort Bliss, Texas a little bit with um, guns, and then they took us into the mountains towards uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico which is about 25 miles away from the town of my, my town, into the mountains. They had a camp there, army camp there. They took us over there, and we trained on uh, rifles, machine guns, hand grenades, just like a battle town. You know? And uh, we had all kinds of, and then we, we trained how to make foxholes, just to make a round foxhole. When we were in the army out there in the real battle zone, we had to make real long, like a grave, so you can put at least four guys in there, because one guy took a long time to, to build that one hole, you know. And then we we were we were stationed right inside this big forest. They used to call it the Black Forest. I don't know if you heard of it, Germany in Germany, the Black Forest. He was. It was so thick of pine trees. I mean, I'm telling you, there was pine trees so thick that when the, we started digging holes there, we couldn't dig holes because the roots were, we had to cut the roots with the little hatchets and then make the skull square and just sit there and waited for the Germans to come and throw us hand grenades. But we didn't let them get close to where we were because as soon as we see them coming, we start blowing them with the machine guns. But like I said, the big shot, German big shot, they send a guy with a white flag telling us, telling our commanders to surrender or suffer the consequences, you know. So then the German guy, he didn't know what the hell he meant when he said, the guy said, that's to you guys. And the guy went back and I guess he told him the same thing. Nuts, he said nuts. I guess the, the big Germans knew what he meant. So then pretty soon they start, they start bringing the troop down. A line of troops, they're so line man, so long man, you couldn't see the line of troops. And then on one side it was uh, that uh, General Patton and the German tanks. They had a big battle there with the German tanks. and They blew the German tanks to pieces. Man. So they caught them off guard. And uh, we, we caught the guys coming, the foot soldiers, German soldiers. We caught them, we were prepared with machine guns and everything. And then I, I had an M1. I carried a new one all the time. And then uh, one of the guys used to carry a BAR. You know what a BAR is? Mm -hmm. It's an automatic gun or a single gun. So the guy that was carrying the bear gun it was in my platoon. He got shot and then uh, he dropped. 
the gun and, and then the guy, the, the sergeant said, you get the gun, get the BAR, hurry up, hurry up. I got the BAR and they started doing the same thing. <laughs> but they went for automatic weapons, you know, the German, the German soldiers. They see a machine gun, they go right after with the uh, hand grenades or uh, what do you call those, bazookas? Mm -hmm. Or uh, motor, motor, motor shells. Mm -hmm. Those motor shells are very powerful. They didn't make noise. See? And then the artillery shells didn't make noise either. You could, you could just see them boom, boom. And they hit the trees. And that's when they hit the tree, they blow up and splinters fly all over the area there. And if you were in a hole and the splinters go in there, and I'm not talking little splinters, big splinters, because it hits a tree and the splinters, the splinters fly out. A lot of bullets. A lot of guys got killed with splinters. It's terrible. Big giant pieces of pine trees. And when were you assigned to the 101st, the Airborne when Division? When I was in... Uh, when I was in, uh, where was I? I was in Berman Heaven, I think. Berman Heaven. And then uh, from there we, we jumped in, uh, we jumped in Birch's Garden. Birch's Garden was where Hitler was headed, mountain, with a nest on top, we had all the offices on top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. We had, we got to go into Birch's Garden, we took over Birch's Garden from one side and we cleaned it all out, see. And it was, it was just, I was in the regular army then. And was, uh, we jumped there and we jumped in Birch's Garden. And we jumped, and we made about, I don't know, about two or three jumps. We, we jumped behind uh, the Battle of the Belge. And we had to go clear that area too because the, the Germans were right there. They had our special units there. And Battle of the Belge. We jumped in the belly of the bell with Bell Stone, and uh, there was another one there, Saint Low, Saint Low, and uh, the bell of the bell was uh, the last one, and then we 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 had to go to Holland. In Holland, we had to we were in Holland. And the Germans were already gone, but uh, the the. The Germans stayed on one side of a small town close to Holland, and uh, they were they they had the 82nd Airborne surrender. Mm -hmm. So so they told us that we had to go rescue those guys from the Germans. So we had to go and rescue the 82nd Airborne from from Holland. There, it was all uh, it was a small town close to Holland. So we had to rescue the Airborne there, 82nd Airborne. The Germans were getting ready to go clean them out, keep shoot them all, man. They shoot them out. Man. They didn't take any prisoners, the Germans. <clears throat> so did you volunteer for the Airborne? Yeah. No. Well, they 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 came over and they asked they they asked when we were in training that we we need some uh, we need some people for the Airborne. The hundred first was kind of alone in the people. So they said, what well, what well, Airborne are we gonna go because there's quite a few of them. So then they say we had, we need some people at the, the 101st Airborne Division. So we go we went, and we saw the guy with the eagle. So I like the eagle. <laughs> so I said I'll, I'll volunteer for that. So I volunteer for that, and then a lot of guys went in right behind me. And when when did you volunteer? You were still in the U.S. at that point. I was no, I was in uh, close to. Uh, Close to Germany already. I was close to Germany. Getting ready to go to the small towns and starting to opening up the road for the troops. You know, you know. There's a lot of Germans, man. They take, they're taking over. All, they took the, the coast, the, the towns of uh, Birmingham, and full of Germans. And that's where I that's where I boarded a ship to come home from Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Man, when I went there, man, everything was blown to pieces. So you joined the, the 101st Airborne after the D-Day invasion? Yeah. No, well, the D-Day invasion was on when I joined the Airborne. So did you jump with them? No, I didn't jump over the Airborne. I jumped behind the Airborne. I mean, behind D-Day. 
Right. Because that not on the beach, but behind the beach. Behind it, because they they found out that the Americans they had all kinds of uh, spies working on that side. They found out that they're sending troops, uh, German troops, in trucks to behind the D-Day for to help the guys in the pillboxes to stop the Germans from landing in D-Day. I mean the Americans, and they had a. They had pillboxes all along the coast there. I don't know if you, big suckers, man. It's a man big, you, the shells, you had to throw hand grenades in through that hole to get rid of some of the Germans in there. They had, uh, they had maybe 10, 20 guys in there. Machine, uh, guys that were hiding and, and were working with machine guns from different sides. So when you left the US, did you go to England for training? No. When I, when I went to the U.S. When you left the U.S. Oh no, I went to, I went to, uh, where did I went to? I went to a town in Camp Chance, I think it was. In, Eng- in England, right close to the border. So did you do training? No, they, we didn't do too much training. We just, they just uh, lectured to do this. We, we had a border. They had a big field with all the kind of planes ready to go. Mm-hmm with all the equipment, the C-47, C-48, C-46s. They had a big old plane there, that's what they used. And they said, you're gonna, you're gonna go and, and land in a certain area. They didn't tell you where. So they landed and we got on the plane, we just take off. What did you jump out of? We jumped out of the C-47, okay. or 47, C-46s. They were the same kind of plane. Except they were troop carrier planes. So I'm um, I'm assuming you had training jumps before. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So where did those occur? We train in we train in uh, in Fort Bliss, Texas. We train in a little bit of training there, and uh, we took us. They had a big mountain there, see, and they took us planes in there. We used to land in the big area in the field, by a bunch of those uh, brush, and we got tangled up in there. And they, because he said when you jump in, in Germany, you're gonna be landing on top of machine guns, not 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 brush. So tell me about the first jump that you made. How did uh, that feel? First jump, uh, it felt kind of weird. A lot of guys chickened out. There was quite a five guys chickened out. The first jump, I said, when when they told me that uh, they were shooting the, at the planes. When they told me that guys, some of the guys, they didn't know they didn't, they how to cook the parachute because the, per- the plane was shut up. So they had to crawl out of the door. See, when they told me that, I said, man, I'm glad I hooked up before. Because I hooked up right away. And you, the parachute opens about 10, 20 feet before before you hit the, you know, I mean, after you hit the jump. Yeah, after you jump yeah. out. Yeah, only 10 feet or 20 feet or something. And then uh, you got your hand on your pair and your, uh, pair, your spare sheep here, see, in case you don't open, you just open the pair sheet, that's a special one. So how many training jumps did you make before oh, you went to England? Uh, I trained quite a bit on there. It was kind of, uh, at first it's kind of rough because the guy was kind of rough with you, you know. The, the, when you stand on the, in the board on top of the, what was it, three, four hundred feet towers? When you stand on the top there, you start thinking, I said, you think I should jump? And the pressure's got already open. So you, they, if you don't jump, they put you right, <laughs> they put you right out. Because the shoes is already open. Just, so that way, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad after. At first, at first it's kind of scary, but... So if it's going to be scary, you know. That, that training kind of helps. That train, because when you jump all those towers, I think they were three, three or four hundred feet high. Yeah. They're pretty high towers. And when you jump out of the plane, what altitude uh, are you jumping I from? Jump out of the plane about, where you, I tell you what, we jumped out of the plane about, about almost the same, about three hundred feet or, but then when they start shooting at the plane, the plane start going up higher, see. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I said, man, I, I'm glad I jumped before they went higher. Because when they start shooting, the planes start going higher and higher. 
and it would be about 500 feet, maybe you get tired. Because mm -hmm. the bazooka would treat him with machine gun and everything they had. And then the guys in the in the street or the, the town where we were town, they were shooting at the parachute, they were dropping down. We were shooting the guys coming down on the parachute, they were being shot. Some of the guys would get shot before they got killed, before they even hit the ground. There's a lot of guys laying there, man, bleeding to death, and shit. And you couldn't stop and help them because they had, they had medics uh, already down there, mm -hmm. see. The medics wouldn't stop the bleeding because they had big holes. It was terrible. It was, it was a nightmare there. Yeah. Now, as you guys were preparing to jump into uh, to yeah, France... Yeah, well, the best thing, the best thing for us was make sure you hit the ground right. Mm -hmm. Is that a guy didn't hit the ground right? They hit the ground first, body first. They they don't want to be standing up because they shoot you down. Yeah. The Germans were shooting you right there in the streets. Mm -hmm. But once they once they get those guys uh, standing up, they start shooting at the Germans. See, mm -hmm. so we had automatic weapons and they had a we had M1s. Mm -hmm. And the guys when they start when they land standing up, they start shooting at the Germans standing in the street. In the sidewalk. They used to hide behind the sidewalk too in the planes basket. Some of the guys were inside the window of the houses. Because they were like a town there, you know. Can't remember the name of that town there. We had a we got behind a they had like a had like a big street there. Mm -hmm. It was a big uh, a big pool like a like a well, big giant well a circle as big as this room here. We got inside there and started shooting the Germans. But the Germans, you gotta watch out, they had two bazookas, man. And they had those hand grenades, and made, like a hammer, and so they can throw this thing real far, too. Mm -hmm. That was a powerful machine, a bazooka, a uh, hand grenade. So when you guys were in England preparing to jump into France, yeah. Do you remember what was going through your head and and? Yeah, man. I hope we didn't jump behind the German lines because they're waiting for you. You know, they'll be waiting for you. Did they tell you you'd be landing yeah. behind enemy yeah. lines? Yeah, we had to land behind. We had to land behind enemy lines. You couldn't be. We couldn't land on top of the Germans because they're shooting you down like like birds. So were you nervous at all? Yeah, you better believe it. I wasn't the only nervous man. We didn't even have a we didn't even have a bulletproof vest. They, they would have been helped a lot. Other guys get get shot all over. But I told you there were Germans in the town, man. Hundreds of them just shooting you. So did as soon as seen that the planes coming in, they know there was paratroopers. Yeah. Because they knew the the paratroopers. Because the Germans had a lot of paratroopers too. There was some that were in a the town there. And they, they already had landed there, see, they knew what the score was. So when, when we landed, the good thing that uh, the guys that landed standing up, very able to the, shoot at the ones on the street, they helped the other guys. Because a lot of, a lot of paratroopers were going down. Now the, the initial invasion got, it got delayed a day, correct? Yeah, yeah. So do you remember that day the night before, when you were preparing to go, and and then to be told that the invasion would be delayed. Yeah. Do you remember what was going through your head at that we point? Thought, we thought we were going to go and land in the in the D Day, and see in front of D Day, so they could stop the Germans from uh, taking the troop landing in the in boats. And no, it wasn't that way. We had to land behind them and stop the ones coming to the landing. And uh, it was it, it was a massacre yeah. on so both si both sides. He killed those. It was those German trucks, you know. They were big German trucks. They, they, they loaded with uh, German soldiers, and they're all full of equipment. They all had machine guns, and you know the Germans had automatic guns, a lot of magic, like Tommy guns. We had we just had the Tommy guns, the, the sergeants and. Uh, all the non cops had Tommy guns. We had uh, BARs. Mm -hmm. I had a BAR. 
And they told me, you better make sure you get good cover because that's, they go after the BARs and the automatic machine guns. Because, you know, you can sweep out of And they did. They used to cut down these guys in Germany in, in holes, yeah. right on the D-Day. They had holes, and then the guys had them in the, in the, in the, the, the pill boxes, cement that white in there. Bullets wouldn't do nothing there. They had to go in there, sneak behind the the bill box, and throw a hand grenade to the the hole that wide, just enough to pick the rifle and shoot at the American. And, th and make the th hole that wide and throw the hand grenade in there, and clean every guy's inside the hand grenade. See, that's what made it stop. The, that's what made those soldiers, American soldiers, advance. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, when the guys that risked their lives putting that hand grenade in there. A lot of guys made it, a lot of didn't make it. They just got enough time to, to throw it in close to the body and then they didn't do nothing. You had to go in there and sneak behind the neck to it and put it through the beholder. And then blow the, the inside of the pillbox in there. They had everything in there. They had ammunition and everything. They were prepared for the D-Day. Now, do you remember that morning when you guys were boarding the plane and getting ready to, to yeah, take off? Yeah, everybody was nervous. Man. Yeah. Did you have any close friends? You know, a, a no, few... Well, uh, we, were, we were all friends. All those guys in that plane we were all friends. Yeah. Everybody knew everybody. And everybody was nervous. How many men were in the plane? Oh, I think it was about, I don't think maybe about 50 or maybe more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was uh, planes, they had a lot of planes in there. Do you remember what time you guys took off? No, it was uh, early in the morning mm -hmm. because they had to be there early in the morning. They, they figured that we catch the guys to sleep. <laughs> you jump while it's still yeah. dark out. No, no, they they, they know they had spotters. Mm -hmm. See, the general had spotters spotting the plane coming in, mm -hmm. and then when the the Germans start coming in where we were in the forest there, the black forest. They start coming in. They were like a herd of buffalo. Mm -hmm. And then uh, pretty soon the Americans start sending those P-38, P-47 uh, uh, fighters, fighter planes, and P-35, P-38, and send them, send them ground level and cut down those Germans that were coming in, big troops of Germans. Man, I cut them down with 50 caliber machine guns. And mm -hmm. Then and then when they run out, it, the old, another bunch come over to do the same thing. Yeah. And then that guy, General Patton, and his tanks went to the other side of the, uh, the, the troops, the German troops. The Germans had about 10, 10 German tanks, uh, divisions over the west side. And uh, General Patton had, I don't know how many divisions of tanks, started blowing the tanks up. German tanks, he blew just about all of them too. Man. Once you, once the tanks lose the, the tracks, they can move. You mm -hmm. gotta stay there. And when they stand there, there's a good spot for the, the American tanks to shoot them because they can move. You know, because when they, when those tanks used to move, they used to go like this to keep the shells from hitting them. And once they hit the the, the big old chain, they else. They can't move. They keep going around in circles. So tell me about when you, when you jumped out over France. Do you remember that that instance? And uh, well, I was kind of nervous. Were you guys experiencing? Uh, uh, yeah, you don't know. We were. We we heard that they told us that the, the German soldiers on the ground shooting at the paratroopers coming down the first wave. See, when I went in, uh, I didn't go in the first plane. I went in about the maybe the third plane. They went in there. The first and second plane is the one that got it, mostly. Because those are the first guys that jumped there. But then when the third, I think it's on the third or fourth plane that I was. And then when I jumped in there, I jumped there was the soldiers were already being chased away there. Because they were they were right in the middle of the street shooting at the, the soldiers coming down. And, the, and the, they were shooting at the plane too. But they were shooting at the paratroopers coming down on the ground. A lot of guys got hit before they even hit the ground. Did your plane get hit at all? Yeah, I got the, the plane that I was. When I when I looked up, the, 
the tip of one of the wings on the left, right side, they blew the wing out. And the plane was going sideways, you know. And then it was going down. That's when the, the guys that came down that made it to the ground, they told us, we had to crawl, we couldn't hook that parachute on the cable because they told us to crawl out the door. So they told us that we had to crawl out the door. And they, they were, they weren't being shot from the guys on the ground because the guys on the ground already were shooting at the Germans. So they kind of stopped shooting at the guys front and down. So when we came down from the third plane, it was all right, you know. But when we came down, uh, I came down on the hook plane, but the other guys, they told us that we, didn't, we couldn't hook because the plane was, was hit by a shell, you know. So they told the guys, you don't, don't have time to hook up because you don't get a hook up, then you gotta walk to the door. You gotta, you gotta crawl as much as you can, you crawl two guys at a time. So your plane ended up crashing, the one yeah, that you were in. Yeah, plane crashed with the pilot, and I don't know how many troopers are in there. There was, uh, there was some in there that were still in there. So were you one of the first men to jump out? Yeah, but uh, we had time to jump, but the guys that were in there, in the last part, they didn't have time to jump because the plane already been hit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy that uh, they made it, they crawled the plane, they crawled through the door, and they hit the ground. They said, oh man, that's the first time I jumped without a, without a cable. So they had to manually yeah, pull the Yeah, they had shoot. to manually, but, but they didn't use that because of the, the parachute, they, yeah, they'd use a manual, but the other parachute didn't open because they were looking for that tip to hold the cable up. Yeah. See, but then when you're jumping, man, you, you can't move your hands that good because you're going 90 miles an hour. So the pressure you're heavy. Yeah. So after you had jumped out and your chute had opened up, um, how long were you floating down, descending to you, the ground? You float, uh, before you hit the ground, about let's say, about 20, 30 feet before you hit the ground, you go, you go, you go fast. When you hit the ground, you hit it fast. But how long were you in the air for before oh, you, no, no. from when you left the plane to when you touched the ground? From the plane, we were already going up. We were going up to about four feet, four feet up the ground, four hundred feet off the ground, mm -hmm. four hundred feet. Three hundred feet is the most they would climb to for the paratroopers to jump, and uh, they would train for that. See. But then when they start shooting at the plane, the plane start going higher up. The one that I got on got a little higher, but maybe half ways, and I got a chance to jump out with a chute. But the other guys, I don't know how they made it or not. And do you remember looking around and? No, I had time. Yeah, I had time. I just had time to look at the ground. So the ground, you were, you were on the ground before oh. you knew it. Oh yeah, man. You, 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 there was no wind. The, the, I didn't see no wind. The parachute opens up with the wind, but it's with the weight of your body. And uh, you come down slow, but when you get to a certain height, you go fast. Mm -hmm. And you hit the ground hard, you know. The good thing was dirt and trees and everything. A lot of guys were hanging on trees and stuff like that. Man, I'm glad I didn't hang on a tree because a lot of guys were hanging there by the net. Mm -hmm. So the tree hanged up in the trees and the, the Germans would pick him up like flies there. You know? yeah. And that, that's a lot of guys that died before even hit the ground. So once you landed, what did you do after that? We had a, when we landed, we, we, the sergeant had to organize us, organize, get a group together, not to scatter. He want everybody together in a group and then attack the town there where the Germans were hiding the buildings there. And did you guys land where you were supposed to, or did you no, miss we, your target we landed, at all? We landed, but then we didn't land. It. There was a lot of trees there. Mm -hmm. We landed where there's, we, we jumped close where there's no trees, but then when the, when the wind takes away and the shoot you move around, we land where the trees are. A lot of guys were landing on trees. When you land on a tree, man, if you're lucky to hook on the first branch, it's all right, but if you don't, man, you go, Keep sliding down and it's that wraps around your neck or whatever. It was it was horrible. Seeing a lot of those guys hanging there yelling for help or 
some of the guys didn't make it to the ground. They had to go in there with a cut, cut the rope down with a knife. And they had a knife, but they didn't hit a chin because they were all wrapped up in the strings there. And how did it make you feel seeing your buddies get shot and killed and... and... Well, you know, I felt kind of bad, man. Yeah. You know, it's kind of lucky he wasn't you. Yeah. That's the way I felt. Everybody was saying, man, I'm lucky I made it on time. Because a lot of the guys, the last guys that were in the tail end of the, of the plane, and they had to walk and hook up. And when they got to the door and the plane got hit, the guy said, don't hook up, don't hook up, crawl out the door. Mm-hmm. Told them to crawl out the door because the, the, the wind was messed up, you know, with the wind close to the door. They, they, they were just waiting for that plane to crash. Now, Some, do you know how many of how many of the guys on your plane survived? A lot of guys went with the plane, the tailgate. Yeah. They didn't make it. I didn't make it. And if they made it, they made it, but uh, they were kind of uh, wounded and uh, scared. They didn't, they didn't open the parachute, so they crashed with the plane and everything. It was a, it was a nightmare there. Yeah. I tell you, man, you can sleep at night. Start thinking about those guys. <laughs> Some of those guys used to jump and get tangled in the chute and the tangled in the neck. I don't know how they, the, the wind, the wind would, the, the parachute just goes, goes around like this. It goes around your neck and you can untie it because the wind will hold the, the, the neck up and you can't be being strangled. A lot of guys got strangled with those big cords there. Man. You couldn't get a hold of the thing. Yeah. And they had, they, we all had knives. A lot of guys could cut that knife or cut their throat up, and then they cut the top of the... But they, uh, some of them did, but not, some didn't have the chance. They were going down too fast. And once especially the parachute was collapsed. Yeah. So you can imagine how fast you're going, with the weight of your body. And that means every, every one of those guys probably weighed 140, 150 pounds. And once you guys landed on the ground and got organized again, tell me about the next day. What what happened? Over well, the... we 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 got we got organized, and we established a, a we established a place where we could stay in a, a cement walls and buildings, and then we we had to go in and check every building for Germans, because the Germans that were there, they took off when they saw that we landed. We landed a lot of them, a lot of paratroopers landing there. When they saw that that many paratroopers, and the Germans didn't stay there too long. So we went to the houses, searched all the houses. We found a lot of civilians there praying, you know. Some civilians were crying, and I don't know if they were Germans. <laughs> but they were Germans, but I mean, I don't know if they were dressed like, like civilians. But uh, they didn't, they didn't have no guns. Oh man! And then when we hit uh, the end of the forest, almost the end of the war, we hear uh, we heard a uh, a big commotion coming into the woods. You know, we were camping right there, having something to eat. We heard a big commotion, a lot of talking. So what the hell? We got our guns ready, man. And we seen a bunch of Germans coming in, and a big roll of Germans coming. Hundreds of them, you know. So they they didn't have no guns, and say we got the guns ready, you know. They start raising their hand and say, "No, no, some German is speaking." He said, "No, no, we we gave up. We we dropped we dropped our guns. We they dropped all the guns when they heard that Hitler got killed or got poisoned or something. Everybody was given up. They were capturing a lot of Germans." They didn't have no gun, no rifles. And then we're searching some of those guns. Some of those Germans had guns in their, in their sack over here. Mm. So we used to search them real good. But they were German, they were, they were giving up the war. They weren't giving up the war. Yeah. Because uh, the, German, the Germans were being, they were German, they were being chased by the Russians. The Russians were really cutting them down. The Russians weren't taking no prisoners. They just shoot them down. Mm-hmm. Russia when they when they landed in Berlin the, the Germans 
they landed on half of the, uh, the land, and the Russians took over that half, and then we, we landed on half of Berlin, and uh, the, one of the general, our generals said, why don't you let the Russians take over the other half? We take this half. He took the other half, mm -hmm. and that's what happened. The Russian figure, they came over and started shaking hands and check, changing hats, helmets. Mm -hmm. But they were all happy. But uh, they cleaned the Germans up bad, and yeah. they caught a lot of Germans. And you know what? The Germans, the Russians, they, they used to shoot all the Russians. And the wounded Russians, they land right on the snow. There was snow, a lot of snow. They landed right on the snow. They were wounded. The Russian wouldn't help, and they, they didn't have no aid, they didn't help, and they just let them bleed to death. And they were, and he, and they, the Americans used to wound, and used to take care of the wounded. You know. But these Russians, they, they, were, they were pushing this Russian out of Russia. Because they were pretty, the Russians were pretty close to Moscow. Mm -hmm. See, and then we said that the Americans started giving them ammunition, they started giving them tanks, and uh, got a kind of equipment, and that's when the Russians start pushing the Germans out of there. And they start, the Germans start running back to, to Berlin. And that's when, uh, they, they, then that's when, that's when I found out that Hitler killed himself, yeah. shot himself. They said that, some of the Russians said that he poisoned himself, but the poison didn't work very good. So I heard that he told one of his second guys that would take care of him to shoot him. And that's what I heard. Now there's a lot and that then he told him to make sure when he shot him, they cremate him. Yeah. And then the guy said he cremated him. So they never found the body. No, they, they didn't find the body. That's it. But the guy said they were they cremated because they they had to the ovens for these two burned prisoners. Mm -hmm. And he said he wanted to cremate in one of his ovens. Mm -hmm. He got cremated in one of his ovens. And I imagine they cremated his wife or girlfriend, Eva. Yeah. Eva, Eva Brown, something. Now you went through a lot, uh, you know, from the, from oh. landing in France. There was a lot of time between landing yeah. in France oh, and then yeah. the end of the war. So, yeah. um, I went right through the France. Went through France. Went through Germany. Yeah. So let's I'm talk ready. about your experience in in France a little bit and and sort of your day to day yeah. life there. In and France, we were fighting. We still fighting Germans in France. Yeah. The Germans in France. They're, the Germans in France, they were all scooped up in pillboxes, but they used to have uh, walls made out of the same buildings, good walls, cement walls, and they used to fight us in, in the town. They used to go into the town. They used to fight us from their windows, and we had to blow up the houses with uh, the cannons, bazookas, and that's the only way you could get rid of the Germans in the town. There. And would you encounter them every day? Just about every day for a whole day, Mr. Dad John German. Finally, they start chasing them out of there. They start running. Back to, they went back to the Siegfried Lines. They went as far as the Siegfried Lines. They went across. The Siegfried Line was like the, the line of Germany and France and all that. Yeah. They, they didn't want tanks to come across. And the American tanks couldn't make it. Yeah, they, they brought those big old tanks with those blades, picking right out there. Just knock them down and then run over. Now, did you guys meet up with with any of the infantry divisions? We met up with some in uh, when we when we went across the Siegfried lines. We met a lot of uh, pockets of Germans. They were behind uh, the forest yeah. and behind uh, buildings, brick buildings, and you know brick buildings. And you had to shoot them with a cannon to break the walls, and the Germans started getting out of there. But were you guys fighting along with any of the, any of the American infantry? Yeah, no, we were fighting with the American infantry. They had the the big red one. Mm -hmm. He was a big red one. I was with the big red one at one time. Mm -hmm. They were they were in front, you know, big red one division. They were fighting the Germans hand to hand. Yeah. Those guys would go in there real fast. They were they were pretty powerful, mm -hmm. and we used to go to one side and. We used to jump all the way behind the Germans when the Germans were fighting. You jump behind, and that's where you and they lose their. So, at any point, did you did you guys ever uh, 
confuse the American troops for German troops since you guys were surrounded on, no, on both sides. I had, I had to walk it talk and they could connect, connect with it. So we, they, and then with the, the, when they see the parachute jumping behind the German lines, they know it was Americans. And they can tell with the, Amer the Americans flags right away. And uh, the Germans, as soon as seen the parachute jumping behind them, they didn't know what to do. They were fighting both sides. Mm -hmm. the, the one, the big red one and the 71, the 71 division and the third division, the fourth division, a bunch of divisions were fighting the Germans. The Germans, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do. Finally, they, they, they found out that Hitler killed himself. They started dropping their guns and giving, giving up. Now, you had made other, other jumps besides... We made a... The last jump we made was in uh, in a place they call uh, Saint Lo, I think it was Saint Lo. But, uh, but when and then when we jump, after we jump, we we can convert ourselves into foot soldiers. You know, yeah. that's what the bear troopers did. When you jump in a place like that, you just convert you into foot soldiers because they can they can take you they can pick you up and put, take you back in the plane and do the same thing. No, once you jump in a place, you gotta you gotta equip for a foot soldier. And you get rid of your parachute and all your stuff. And, but uh, like I said, they should have given you some vests, uh, some vests, you know, with some bulletproof vests. No, they didn't use they didn't use the bulletproof vests. So how many jumps did you make in total? We made about uh, in in combat. We made I made about three jumps in combat. St. Lo, Best Stone, and, uh, and uh, France. France. In France, I made one jump in France. In France, that's when we chased that jump out of France. They were, we're already, they were already going out because the French and the English were helping us. The English were, the English were already waiting for the Germans. The Germans are sending those uh, bomber planes. Those uh, rocket planes to France, to Germany, to England. Remember, they were landing in England, but then they were waiting for them to destroy some of those troops, and so they can land. But the Americans and the French soldiers start pushing the Germans out of there. When they when they when they found out the Germans that were on the other side, they found out that Hitler killed himself or pointed himself. They, they kind of dropped their guns and they gave up and they went home. They were going home. They saw a lot of guys going home. They said, where are you guys going? You, we got to be going home. We've got to go home. They got to find out the place to go home. They had to walk because they had no transportation. Transportation was all gone to pieces. <laughs> now you had to sleep on the ground a lot. Yeah, I, I, I slept on the ground. Were you able to, to find rest? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we had a lot of guards. When you sleep in the ground, you had a bunch of guys around you. Mm -hmm. And you, you're far away from the battle line. But uh, some of the places you couldn't sleep because you had to wait for the Germans to come in. The Germans were kind of sneaky, you know. They are kind of sneaky. Mm -hmm. They kind of sneak behind your back. And, and we knew how they were. That's how they sneaked into France. They caught those guys off guard. The French soldiers were, were shooting at the French, at the German soldiers from windows in the buildings. Mm -hmm. But the Germans were shooting at the windows with bazookas and cannons. Mm -hmm. See, and we did the same thing to Germans when they got into the big buildings. Now, when you guys jumped into Bastogne, how, what was that experience like? Well, in Bastogne, when we, we jumped, we'd seen a lot of Germans lining up, getting ready to clean us up. But we, we got them. We had other troops next to us, besides us. Because when we, we jumped, they had the 1st Army Division there, the 71 Division, and the other division on east right, east end because they, everybody was pushing the Germans out of there. Mm -hmm. And we jumped there because the Germans were 
had pockets, you know, pockets of Germans. Whenever they see a, a, a small troop of Americans, they, they come out and start shooting them. Mm-hmm. And then the Americans found all that out where they were hiding. They gave up. Pretty, they, they gave up. When they found out about Hitler killing, killing himself, I, I guess they were just taking orders from him. When did you get wounded? I got wounded uh, in one of those black forests when I was jumping inside the hole. See, when we were jumping in the hole, we seen the Germans coming in, in, in Bamberg, Germany. They were coming in, big hurts the Germans. And everybody started running to the foxholes, you know, and started getting ready because, uh, and they were, they were, the planes were dro- uh, dropping uh, seed rations for us to eat because we, re- we ran out of food. How long were you without food for? Oh, gee, we were there for a week there until we found out that the Germans were lining up to attack us. That was going to be their final attack. They, they're going to be either final or, and that was the final for them because uh, the paratroopers jumped in there and re- reinforced those guys. And, uh, we, we, we went in trucks to the best stone. We went in trucks because the planes weren't loaded with ammunition like they are supposed to. They had to reload it with, uh, with paratroopers. And, uh, so we went in trucks around and we went for the Germans with tanks and started shooting at the trucks. And then the Americans started shooting at the, at the Germans and they started shooting at the tanks, they were shooting at the trucks. And then we unloaded the truck and we marched over the other trucks in the forest, the other troops in the forest there. And then they, we, we got, they had guns, the, the, the planes dropped guns, ammunition, and the guys in the forest had, had guns and got the, a hold of the ammunition. They didn't get a hold of the key rations, they got a hold of the ammunition and they started shooting at the Germans. So you guys were without food for about a week. Yeah, no food and ammunition was low. So when they dropped the supplies, well, there was food was, and ammo and everybody went for the ammo. Forget about the food, you get the ammo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what the, the big shot used to say, the same thing. Was this, was this during the winter time? It was, uh, it was close to the winter because it was kind of windy, a lot of snow. It was like in uh, December sometime. So this was a little bit before the Battle yeah, of the Bulge. Yeah, yeah, before the Battle of the Bulge. And no oh, man, I'm telling you, it was cold, cold weather. No, oh, you. So you were man. telling me how you how you got hit. I got hit when I, I was jumping. I jumped into the fast hole, and I had my leg sticking out, and German started joining with a machine gun. Got hit in my leg, and they broke they broke this bone right here. They cut me right here, they cut me right here, and they patched me up. And then I was I was there for about two weeks in back of the in back of the combat training there. The soldiers, they had tents with uh, medics in there. And they, they, they took me over there and they patched my leg and everything. They put a, like a cast, it wasn't a cast, like a, like a leather deal, you know. And I was okay then. How many times did you get hit? One time. Just one. That was the only time. <laughs> and how did that feel? Well, I didn't feel nothing until I got into the first hole and this guy looked at my boot full of blood. He said, where is the blood coming from? So I picked up my pants and there was a big old hole right here. And they had to sew me right here, put stitches in here. And sew me up, patch the bone there, which I don't know what they did, it put, put the bone together. It wasn't broken completely, it was kind of a chatter, you know, because they called me going down there. You know. If they would have called me, I was running towards the hole. When I ran, I jumped, I took my feet up, and I seen them guys under the hole, and I just landed with my, my head first and my body, my leg was sticking out. Who think they didn't get my both legs? Were you the only one that got hit? Yeah. The and guy said, you, you got hit in the leg, you're lucky. You got, you probably go home now. You, they got a million dollar wound. I said, bullshit. So I went to the medics there and they started pressuring me up real fast. How long were you were you in the hole before you were able to, to get medical right attention? Right away, the, the medics came over and they said, uh, they told me out to the to the tent. where The, the tents were far away from where we were at. It's like tents, you know, for medics or for wounded soldiers. 
They had a lot of wounded soldiers in there. And they took me in there and, and they said, oh, hey, it's just a, a wound in their leg. I said, you're lucky you only got a leg wound. I said, you'll be all right in a little while. So, so I was in bed for about a few days and then I started walking, you know, feeling better. And then for two weeks, I finally started walking. And they called, the commanders called up, and the Commander Barry, well, the, the Captain Barry and the Lieutenant, Lieutenant Street that we had. He called up the, the, and the paramedics, the tent, and said, oh, he's all right, he's already walking, he can walk already. So we'll send him, send him back over here to the division. So they sent me back. He said, hey, he's already walking to the PX, he went to get some beer. <laughs> well, I just walked, I didn't want to go, to, I didn't go get some beer. I didn't want to get drunk over there. <laughs> So I went back, I went away to dad, walking. The guy saw me there when I started walking. He said, what happened to your leg? He said, I thought they cut it. Well, they did cut it off. They put a new one there. And then he said, let me see it, let me see it. <laughs> now, when you were at the field hospital, were there a bunch of other guys that were wounded? Oh, those guys, some of those guys were pretty bad shape. Those guys were, those, all those guys were going statewide. Man. I think I were going statewide. Guy were wounded in the stomach chest and uh, shoulders, when they, they couldn't even move their arms. They, 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 those, those bullets would break your bone, man. Did you feel pretty lucky that you'd only gotten hit in the yeah, leg? Yeah, that's what they told me. So you're lucky you only got hit. And when I told them that I had a wooden leg, he said, oh man, are you going to get home with a wooden leg? And they pick up my, pick up my pants and <laughs> oh, you're a big liar. <laughs> So how long after you had been wounded until you got back into combat? How long oh, was that? After a week, a week after I got back to the to the base there where the guys were stationed. After that, about a week later on, they they gave me they gave me my rifle back, my BAR. I had a BAR. They told me, "Can you carry the BAR?" I go, "Yeah, I can carry the BAR. I can use my left and my right arm." <laughs> How did you feel about having to be sent back into combat? Oh, I felt oh shit, I hope I don't get hit again. <laughs> it, was, it was getting pretty close to the end. So they, they were uh, just about ready for the Germans to surrender. Mm -hmm. Because when they heard that uh, Hitler got killed, or got him killed himself, they kind of gave up. Because mm -hmm. they, they, he was doing... That soldier were doing everything that Hitler ordered. The, the commanding officer used to tell the guy, well, the Fuhrer said do this, do that. And he, he's the one that sent all those troops to the beach over there. And, uh, he'll hold uh, some of the boats that landing in the beach. You know. And then, then he, when Hitler came over to, uh, I mean, uh, Rommel, Rum was the one that he was in charge of the desert there. Mm -hmm. He he was he went to see Hitler, <coughs> and Hitler didn't want to talk to him no more. Him no more. But he said he didn't want to go back over there because the Americans were taking over all the islands, the beaches there. He said it's it's useless. He said we can't keep control of them. They keep coming in. They get coming in a thousand Americans. And they kept moving back, they kept moving back, and that's when Rama went to see Hitler and told him, we had to move out of there or get some more troops over there. He said, no, Hitler didn't want to listen to him. He walked away from him. He got mad. So then I heard that he went to it. Later on, when the war ended, I heard that he went to his house, and he got rid of his uniform, and then he got, he got sick and he died. I don't know, he got sick from But he got wounded too. He got wounded, he got wounded in the shoulder or something. But he got sick and he, he died. Now, did you ever get tired of getting shot at day after day? Yeah, man, I get tired of sick, listening to all those. He didn't know which was the Americans or which <laughs> But the Germans were always, uh, they, they had automatic weapons. They had good automatic weapons. B.A.R. Uh, uh, because the uh, Machine guns, 
just about every GI, every every German soldier had Tommy guns and automatic. We had a uh, M1s that are automatic too, but not that good. You had to aim it. You could, yeah, I had to be a BAR can shoot it from the hip, you know, like a machine gun. And then, but they then he only had maybe 20 bullets. He had to carry some extra sh uh, cartridges, and those things were heavy. And you walk around like that, and ducking down, laying down. Plus all your your yeah. gear and everything else. Yeah, everything was heavy. Everything, even your boots were heavy. <laughs> yeah, man, it was it was it was hell. It was terrible. And you lost a lot of friends over there. Oh yeah, a lot of friends. Just like uh. I guess uh, just as many Germans as, as many soldiers, American soldiers. Mm -hmm. They shoot, they shoot just as many American soldiers. And the only thing you got the American soldier is that the cannons, those, those two wheel cannons. That's called the Americans. If they see a tank shooting at the Americans with machine guns, the tanks had machine guns on both sides. And uh, as soon as the Americans see those tanks shooting machine guns, they, uh, they shoot them with 105 cannons. And they can roll them with two wheels. They can roll them any wheel per web position they want. They shoot those tanks, they start shooting machine guns pretty soon. And then the Americans had a, they had those real cheap uh, tanks. Mm -hmm. the tanks had a, they were no match for German tanks. The German tanks used to block on the roads, just come on the rim of the road and start shooting at the Americans and they blow the tanks up to pieces. They blow the holes in them. The guy had to come out of there and died. But uh, they, this is just uh, Amer Americans, the small tanks, they weren't doing nothing. The German tanks were too powerful. So then they start bringing uh, those big tanks uh, with 90s. Americans start bringing those big tanks with 90s. Start bringing them, and they start putting them in right in the road like the Germans had. They're shooting at the German tanks. They're blowing the tanks to pieces <laughs> with 90s. Wow, man, you were happy to see that the tank began blowing up. Then you had to blow the, the all they had to do was blow be, be, behind the, the chain of the tank. Yeah. Could go right to where the bottom part blew the tank up, and without those chains that they would move, they just couldn't even turn. Yeah. And those German tanks were big, those Tiger tanks. You go to those Tiger tanks. Those were big. I saw one of those in the, in the museum one day. God damn, man! Those guys could have moved that tank up in front of the troops, American troops, and shoot them all down. But see, they were they were still worried about American tanks because the Ameri the, Amer the small American tanks, those M10s, the still M10s, they had small cannon. They didn't do nothing to the German tanks. Bounce of bullet just blew outside the tank. Then when they brought those 90s, oh man, all the Americans got behind the 90s, and there was a good protection. Mm -hmm. 90s opened up with the 90s and man, they blow the tanks right to pieces. Anything, anything they hit, they blow the pieces. They move, they will move. And then the the inside, I guess, uh, they blow the ammunition inside the tank too. You know, the the, ex the, the explosion. And you said you you fought at the Battle of the Bulge as well, correct? Yeah, Battle of the Bell. And talk about your experiences there. Yeah, well, there was a uh, ground ground fighting there. Mostly a foxhole. That's where you go. when you're in foxhole, and the Germans start running out, running out of foxhole. You know we're, we're they're moving out. See, as soon as they start moving out, we jump out of the holes and start machine gun them because uh, they, we know where they gotta move out because they couldn't stop us. Because we had a lot of foxholes and a lot of soldiers. So you were just waiting for them to yeah, we to were appear. Yeah, waiting for them because 
they couldn't they couldn't jump out of the hole and start firing it out because we were waiting for them to come out of the hole and go on the way. And then uh, we had those uh, motors, big old giant motors, not the little ones, the big uh, motors. Man, those things that go right through where the hole was. Boom. Mm -hmm. They start moving out of there. They start getting, we start getting out of the hole because they did. They had real deep holes. In fact, we got to use some of those holes for <laughs> other holes in this tomato. Uh, we were afraid they left some ammunition uh, ready to blow up. Uh, well, we didn't. We didn't go in there. We just go in there and we look around first. You see uh, something that's was buried in there. And we forget it. Mm -hmm. We machine gun the hole. <laughs> Now, you remember how cold it was? Yeah, it was cold. There was a lot of snow down there, man. Was it hard to dig in? Yeah, the whole got ground, man. Well, yeah, it was so hard, so deep, you know. But after you go so hard, so deep, it was okay. Yeah. But no, but so mud, it was hard mud, man. Mm -hmm. You had to go to use a pick. You know how you get a pick and a shovel? And once you, once you break that layer of mud there that's frozen, Everything's all right, and then uh, it was good because uh, you could use the, the layer of the mud to protect the uh, bullets that come in in by a rifle. Then. So we protected, we put the layer of mud in, big layer of mud is thick, man. The bullets would, would go in there, but they wouldn't go past it. How did you stay warm? Well, we just pretend that the body of your own. Your own body's there to get fire, you keep close together. Yeah, we keep close together, keep everybody warm. The only thing we can blow is your feet, man. If we just, that's one thing they didn't give us, uh, thick socks. We got thick socks in the army, and not that thick, you know. Because we used to wear them for a while, and then we get them wet. And when we get them wet, we get to jump in a hole that's got water. And so we get them wet, and all that stuff freezing your feet up. And we used to take them off and, and warm your feet up with your hands and dry the dry the, the, the socks with the sun and there was sun in there. But sometimes there was sun, but there was still snow around there. A lot of snow. I never, I never, I've been, in my hometown, we had to have some cold weather there. We even had snow there, but not like in Germany, man. Wow. Germany was cold weather there. Even the wind cut right through your ears, man. I bet you couldn't wait to get out of there. Yeah, we had to get out of the holes and find a better hole to dry. Yeah. Because the snow, the snow would get full of, the hole would get full of snow, and our body would warm the yeah. snow and melt the snow, mm -hmm. and then pretty soon the water start going up, mm -hmm. and your socks start getting wet, and you get thick socks, but they didn't do any good. Mm -hmm. It just uh, sometimes you kind of feel the the warm of your feet to uh, keep your feet warm a little bit. A lot of guys got frostbite. They lose their toes. They lose their, their foot. Some of the guys lost their legs because they got frostbite all the way to the leg. Did you experience any frostbite? Yeah, I, I got frostbite on my toes. I, I had trouble. I had trouble with my toes. But they they told me you don't you don't have a really bad frostbite. I used to take I just take my feet off the water. Man. It would be better to take them off the water and leave it in the ice cold water. Mm -hmm. it freezes your teeth, and then it freezes all your uh, your leg. A lot of guys lost their legs. Leg, they lost the leg, they lost the, the toes. They didn't even find toes at all. I didn't mind losing your toes, <laughs> but your leg, you forget it. Now you mentioned earlier that you and a buddy had. Um sort of take a, took a week off. Yeah, a week off to go to go to the town. Where'd you guys go? We go to had a town there where they had nothing. They had a bootlegged liquor. Those Germans had liquor, bootlegged liquor. And uh, used to get liquor there, but it didn't taste, didn't taste the same as liquor, I don't know. I never tasted that liquor that much. But they said it was all right. And it was tasted like mostly water, a little bit of sweet water. And then you could tell by the color, kind of faded mm -hmm. color. 
liquor. The only thing I used to like was champagne. The champagne was good. Mm -hmm. The champagne was sealed, you know, and they had bottles. Uh, but then, see, the, the big shot used to get all the champagne. Soldiers get nothing but the, uh, what do you call it, liquor that they used to make it on, in behind the buildings. Mm -hmm. And just to make it overnight, wine. The wine looks like water. It had no taste like wine. It's like water. Put a little bit of something in there. Mm -hmm. Just it makes a little bit of wine just to make it taste like wine. Mm -hmm. but a lot of guys used to drink it. They never got drunk. They never got drunk. Like that. The guys that used to get drunk used to drink the champagne. That champagne was pretty powerful. See, I was sealing bottles. The big shot used to get all that. All the good stuff? Yeah. You gotta, uh, when we stopped in, in Munich, we stopped in Munich, and we chased the Germans out of there, we stopped in a brewery, where they had, they had a brewery where they had beer there. Oh man, we had a ball there. We went in there, we raided boxes of uh, beer and cans, German camps. We used to take it to the to the town the, to the towns where had the windows uh, blocked and uh, patrolled. Keep the Germans from there. And we used to put the, the beer in uh, close to the window where the snow was, so they can be frozen. You know, it was cold. We used to get beer from there. <laughs> well, we got that beer from the brewery. Cause then we hit that play when they had all the beer stacked there in boxes. Oh man, and everybody had cat boxes. I, I guess all the German, all the American soldiers, they, they clean up the brewery there. It was a brewery where they make the beer. Yeah, do you remember uh, where you were when the war had ended in Europe? Yeah, I was in. Uh, I was in uh, a town. My name is Bamberg, Germany. Mm -hmm. Bamberg, Germany. Yeah, we, we were there and, oh man, big celebration, man. Everybody, there was an air base there, a German air base. And uh, they had a lot of German planes there. And uh, we went to the air base and we patrolled the air base, just checking around. We checked all the German planes. There were the Stukas, those planes they used to be flying all the time. They had a lot of them there. And uh, we took over that air, air base. And then uh, we, we, we rented some of those uh, beds they had in there, those camps there, we used to sleep in there. We slept in there, but we had, had good guards in there. And uh, we spent some time there, and then we go out to the, the town. They had a bootlegger, they had a lot of bootlegger beer, and, and they, they used to make uh, all kinds of liquor. They knew the Americans used to like liquor. And that's why a lot of guys used to get drunk and stuff. But uh, we had a lot of beer from the brewery there. I didn't have to go out and drink it. How did you feel knowing that the war was over? Oh, I feel good. Oh, no. When we were we were all drinking there in that place, and then all of a sudden, the, the news came that the war was over. Oh, man, that the Germans gave up, and the, they all surrendered. And, and uh, Hitler, the Hitler killed himself or they killed him. I mean, somebody said that he poisoned himself, yeah. but the poison didn't work on him, so he told his knife next to him to shoot him. That's what uh, we heard from the Russians. But we didn't get to see him because he got cremated. I, I, was, I was hoping I'd see him, you know. But anyway, uh, when we were in Bamberg, uh, we used to go out and, and they had a little town there. They had, we go, and some people would be making beer, stuff like that. They knew the Americans liked the beer, you know. That guy used to get and drink the beer. And then we start hearing the news that the, all the big shots got to the, the ladies knew that the, the Germans had surrendered and they'd give up and they were all, and the healers got killed or got murdered or something like that. And I said, oh boy. That's when we start seeing all kinds of Germans coming in from different directions. No rifle, no nothing. I see what the hell's going on, man. 
So they used to give, they gave up the war. They gave the war up. Hitler, when they found out Hitler got killed, they gave the war up. Everybody was coming back from, from where they were. They're finding the place to go to town. There was no transportation, so they were, someone would walk into town, wherever they lived, around the area, wherever. We were, we were stationed in this big old forest there, and uh, we heard that war in there. That's when we heard all this commotion. And there were Germans coming in through the forest, and we got all prepared, you know, with guns. And then we seen the Germans that came in, all dressed up in clean uniforms, no gun, no rifles. So we asked one of the guys in New England, what happened? What happened to you guys? Are you prisoners? No, we, we, we dropped our gun. We, we're not fighting no more. Hitler, Hitler killed himself or something. Oh, yeah. And then later on, we heard he, he got killed himself or poisoned himself. So when we told the guys, okay, you guys move, start moving that way, but wait a minute. You're going to have to search you. We start searching them, and some guys had guns out here in the socks, mm -hmm. handguns, you know. I got one of those guns at home, chrome plated. I brought home about six of those guns, and I gave the three guns. Went three. My brothers got the gun. My youngest brother and my two brothers, those brothers got got a gun. I don't know what they did with it. And I kept two guns. And when I came to L.A. with my, I got married, came to my L.A. and uh, I had two guns. And I gave one. I drove one to some guy that used to work with me and I got a job over here, and I showed him the gun that I had, a, a chrome-plated gun. I don't know what ever happened to that gun. I don't know if my oldest brother took it or my dad took it, because my dad wanted it gun, see. Because he came to L.A., and I, I brought that gun with me. So I showed it to that guy. They, they, gave, me that, they gave me a car for the gun. Mm. Oh, that's what happened. He he, so he bought me the little gun at 25, and then the chrome plated. He wanted the chrome plated, and I said, oh, I'm not selling the chrome plated gun at 32, chrome plated. And then he said, uh, I give you a car for it. I said, What kind of kind of car did you give me? He said, well, I'll bring it over so you can see it. You know what kind of car it was? A 1936 Ford, with a trunk in the back, four doors, two doors. Uh, four doors and two two seats, one in the back and in the trunk in the back, white. The only thing I needed was a paint job. So I said, hey, I'll give you the gun for the car. Because <laughs> I used it for work for a while. Then I went and bought a new one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I traded it for a 1953 Ford, a new one. And then I gave that to my wife, and I, I kept, I bought another one for her. A 50, they bought another 53 Ford. And that, that was, that's the way, that's the end of my guns. <laughs> now, after you got out of the service, yeah. what did you do for work? Well, I bummed around for about a year. And uh, before I left, my wife wanted a, my, my wife, well, I was just going out with my wife, you know. And I told her I'm going to join the service because all my friends from the, from the school, they got drafted, they go into the service. So I'm gonna join the surfers. They won't draft me because I'm only 17. So I said, well, they're not gonna draft you. You're 17. But I'm not gonna tell them I'm 17. So I went to a local ball in El Paso, Texas, from my hometown. I was going out with my my wife, just going around, and she said, well, don't we get married before you leave? I said, no, no, I'm gonna go to the server first, and then we'll get married and come back. I didn't know I was gonna come back. So I went to the local board and I told them that I wanted to join the service. I wanted to join the the, 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 the Air Force or the Navy. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh yeah. So the guy kept writing and writing the, the, the application and all that stuff. <coughs> and then I said, do you hear me? Don't forget, I want to join the, the Air Force and the, the Navy. And he kept writing. He said, okay, when he finished writing, he got the paper and he, he folded it, he said, I got your application ready. You're gonna go, you're gonna go to the Fort Bliss, Texas, right there close to El Paso. Mm -hmm. You heard of Fort Bliss, Texas? Mm -hmm. Right close to El Paso. 
So he sent me to El Paso, I got full blaze. And they took me in there, it's, a, it's an army, in the army. I said, what? I thought I told the guy I wanted to be in the Air Force. He said, no, he got hit that you want to join the army. You want the army. That son of a gun, he put the army instead of the Air Force. So I went up in the army. So then I, I took training in, in, in Fort Bliss, Texas. Took some training there, combat training, because I was going to be a foot soldier, you know. So I said, okay. So, so then I got, I got finished the training there. They sent me to Camp Me, uh, uh, Camp in Camp Mexi, Texas, in Dallas, Texas, Camp Mexi. And there, a bunch of guys joined the air, the air airborne there, because yeah. they needed guys for the, Some guy came over and said they needed guys for the airborne. Guys sent, they were in the army. So a bunch of guys joined the airborne. So I said, well, I'll join the Airborne. I won't be in the Army. I'll be in the Air. <laughs> so, so I joined the Airborne, and we took a little training and jumping and all that stuff in Fort Benning, Georgia. And uh, that's where the Airborne was. So then Fort Benning, Georgia closed down, and the Airborne, the Airborne, uh, where I was, they moved to Fort Meade, Maryland. Mm -hmm. It's an air, air, Airborne base there. And from there, I took a little bit of training there, and then jump training. Then I, I, they took me to the, the, the port of embarkation. I said, what am I doing in port of embarkation? Well, you're going you're gonna to go overseas. You're going to load up in the ship, <laughs> the ship's over there, in the, the port of embarkation. They took me to the port of embarkation, and they load me up in the ship, and away we went. And it took me about a little over 10 days to get to Europe. Landed in, we landed in France. Mm -hmm. That the D Day was in France, but I landed in France with the, the troops were in France. They took over France, remember? The Germans took over France. So we took over France. We took over the Germans there. And the, 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 the British and the Americans, they chased the French out of the Germans out of France into the Siegfried Lines. Mm -hmm. where the Siegfried Line was the German line there. Yeah. So when you returned home from service? When I returned home from service? Yeah, did you start working? Uh, no, I I looked for a job for a while, but then I, I was I was up for, I worked uh, for almost almost a year. I wasn't doing nothing. So when you found a job, what job did you do? Uh, I was working with a guy that had a truck, and he, uh, he used to uh, load alfalfa bales and cotton bales. Cutting bales are heavy, man. So I, I work with him. He used to pay me only 25 bucks a week. That's 25 bucks a week, man. Shit, man. I got I got about 5,000 bucks from the army when I left the army. So did you move back to New Mexico? Yeah, that's why I didn't work for a year. I, I gave my mother some money, and, and then uh, my grandmother, I gave her some money to come to Los Angeles, and my brother, my oldest brother, and uh, I get some of the money from my dad and my mom. Me and my dad and my second brother and my younger brother stayed with them. And uh, then I, they started working when my dad was a, a foreman at the ranch. Mm -hmm. And he got me working over there too. And I said, I didn't like to work in a farm. They got me cutting weeds and shit like that. So then I said, oh, I don't know. That's when I went and joined the army. And I told the guy that they didn't ask me how old I was. They just said, what do you want to join? The, I want to join the Air Force or the Navy. Yeah. And the guy, that's when I said the guy didn't say nothing, he mm -hmm. just kept writing. When he told me the applicant, the applicant is ready, fold it up, up. he said, I'm going to, you're going to go to the Fort Bliss, Texas, Camp, yeah, Camp Fort Bliss. And he said, I'm going to send the, the, the papers with with somebody I don't know take the papers the papers over there and I went over there they took me in a truck and they they told me okay you're you're in the army now they gave me a uniform start training over there I said what am I training for you want know, training for a foot soldier foot soldier they, they, they sent me out there to the mountains where they had a training center close to Las Cruces New Mexico. Mm -hmm. The Las Cruces was about 24 miles from Anthony. Mm -hmm. El Paso was about 25 miles. 
I'm right in the middle of the state line, Texas, New Mexico. And uh, they sent me over there to train in the, in the middle of the foothills. It was a pool of rattlesnakes and lizards. And I was out there practicing with a rifle and everything. So I left it over there, but uh, maybe one week or two weeks training there. They said, okay, you, you guys are ready to, to go on the regular army. So they sent us to board a chip uh, embarkation. And then you ended up over in yeah, Europe. Yeah. Wind up in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, where the air, airborne was. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys went to the airborne, so I joined the airborne with the guys. Mm -hmm. And shit, all those guys went to the airborne at the same time I did. Some of the guys didn't make it, but we we were airborne. But once we jump uh, a certain place, we were foot soldiers. Mm -hmm. That's why they train us for foot soldiers. So some of the guys that landed over there, the guys that survived the landing, they were working the foot soldiers and yeah. they hit the Germans and the Germans hit us and some of the guys got hit, got killed. But four guys that uh, lived in my hometown got killed there. Did you know them? Yeah. I, got a, I know about four of them. Mm -hmm. Four of them went the youngest one I knew him because he was real young when I, when I was in school. Mm -hmm. He went into the service too. And his brother, one of his brothers, two of his brothers went into the service too. I don't know if they survived or not. I guess they did when, because they came home. When, but the youngest boy didn't come home. He didn't survive. Now if there's anything that you could say to those men that, that never returned home, what would you say to them? Well, I told them about that's a luck, that was a luck of being in the war. I mean, uh, you, you don't know when you're going to get hit. And then that's, that's part of the war, you know. You're going, you're going in and you're going in with orders to go and uh, attack Germans. And they get the same kind of orders we got to go fight the, go fight the Americans. And it just happened that some guys got lucky you're standing up or you start walking and they start going shit. Because they the general had a lot of snipers, mm -hmm. especially along the along the coast where they had all those trees. They had snipers in the trees all the time. Mm -hmm. as, as we hit a lot of areas with trees, that's the first thing the Americans, uh, the soldiers used to do. They used to uh, machine gun some of the top of the trees. And some of the trees would be Two, two snipers in there, they're on top of the tree. You can see them when they drop their gun or they fall. Mm -hmm. Or they just hang there because they're tied down. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to fall. But they just hang down from the side of the tree. Those palm trees, they had a big old tree. So what they did, they put a machine gun there and their rifle, and they cut, they cut the palm trees. They were pretty thick palm trees. They cut the palm tree, they cut it an opening, you know, like where the Americans were coming through. Mm -hmm. That's how I used to shoot a, the sniper used to shoot a lot of uh, guys that were leading the, the troops. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys got shot in the head, and got shot in the helmet and survived. Some didn't survive because the bullet would go right through the helmet. If it hits straight, you know, but if it hits sideways, it won't just bounce. I got a helmet at home. It didn't hit me. <laughs> I was too far to boot down. Boot. I keep down, man. The one thing you gotta learn, you gotta stay down. Mm -hmm. Especially when they had those guys. They they only had a German uh, in, the, in the trees. But when they got, uh, Americans got on top of the trees, they did the same thing to the Germans. Mm -hmm. See, they, were, they were doing it. But I was, I was hoping I'd get to Berlin and uh, get to see Hitler. I want to see Hitler alive. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I have that in mind. I, I want to see Hitler alive. Then when I heard that he got killed, everybody gave up. Yeah. They dropped their guns and they, they surrendered. Now if there's any advice that you could give to, to my generation and future generations, what would that be? Well, I would tell uh, if you was to go to the service, and you go to a war, the main thing is you gotta be careful and keep yourself down and cover up. 
keep cover and make sure you don't expose yourself when there's a lot of shooting because that's the first thing they go for, the guys standing up or sitting down or moving around because a lot of guys move around from one one space to another. <clears throat> a lot of guys used to get killed, just get shot when they were, they get wounded or get killed, they get wounded when they were running from one space to another, you know, moving, trying to get closer to the Germans. Because there were Germans, they had pillboxes too, they had a lot of pillboxes, good pillboxes too. But we used to use some of their pillboxes to fight them. They were their good pillboxes. The only thing about the Germans, the big boxes were, the big window was big and open, you know. So they could put a machine gun right in there. And by then we could see them real clear and you could knock them off. The, 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 snipe, the American sniper can shoot those guys in, in the pill boxes because the windows were wide open like a big, like a window on a car, you know. And they could go and see like this. They put a machine gun right there and they open up when the soldier were coming. And, and the, the American were ducking behind trees or behind uh, anything that protects you from a bullet. They stay there until it's cleared up. And then as soon as they clear it up, they start getting up and then pretty soon they start firing guns. And they get shot. That's why the best thing is just keep covered, man. Keep covered. Stay covered all the time. I I, I keep covered myself, man. I waited till till I see some soldiers get in front of me. <laughs> Cause I seen soldiers come way in front, keep falling down. I know they're getting shot. Mm -hmm. I mean, some get wounded, some get killed. Yeah. Cause they, they used to a lot of those uh, expert guys they used to aim at the head. Of them. And the soldiers, and they didn't aim it. Uh, they know you had a helmet. They had a helmet real deep down into your eyes, but they can shoot right between the. Yeah. They they were good good gun gunfighters. Mm -hmm. They were good shooters like American. They were good shooters. Yeah. And some don't. Some they just shoot whatever they see. Yeah. Uh, but it was a. Uh, it was hell. It was terrible. Never know when you was gonna get hit. You never know if you're gonna make it. I thought I thought I'd never make it home. And when I came back, my wife was surprised. Oh man, I got home. I got me and this guy all got home at the same time. And when they saw us get off the, the Greyhound bus from El Paso to my hometown. Mm -hmm. And they saw us, oh, you get made it back, you made it back. <laughs> sure did, man. I'm glad I made it back. I hope I don't get run over by a car over here. <laughs> Everybody had a car. <laughs> well, oh. thank you very much for yeah, it was, sharing that with me. Thank you, buddy. And thank you for your service and sacrifice. Yeah, it was, it, that was a sacrifice. Actually, actually, every soldier that went through there, they were sacrificing you to your whole life. You don't know when you're going to get hit. You just take a big chance. You know? Well, you guys paved the way for, for me to be yeah. able to do what I'm doing today. So. That's what they told us. So you guys, glad you came back. You paved the way for us. You cleared, you cleared the war. It's the truth. I said, yeah, but thanks to a lot of guys. Man. We owe it to you. Especially the guys that made those Germans surrender. Yeah. Well, a lot of soldiers, man, American soldiers. They took every soldier that was in, in the town, in the town where I lived, they took every soldier, every guy that passed the, the, the test, took them over there. And they weren't asking for too much. Some of them were asking for good eyes, good eyesight, good health. You good health, yeah. Good health. Just got out of school. You're all right. You're on your way, man. It was terrible. It was hell. I still dream about it. I still dream about some of the guys. Got a friend, good friends of mine that get killed right in front of my eyes. Man. 
terrible. And then when they, when they get wounded, you try to stop and try to try to make a try to stop the the bleeding in the leg or something. And the sergeant said, "Keep moving, keep moving. You gotta keep moving." He said, "The paramedics will take care of it." They had a lot of paramedics, you know, but shit, they had a lot of soldiers wounded too. So they, the wounded were just taking turns, you know, stopping the bleeding. They used to stop the bleeding. So that's where they used to lose their life. Just lose your blood, <coughs> the leg or stomach or anywhere where you don't, you don't die instantly. Yeah. Uh, you, start, you lose your blood real fast, especially in your chest. You know, and just like, like a balloon. You know. Imagine it would be hard to leave your, your buddies laying there. And well, like a lot of guys that used to get blown out, but the big hole in the stomach, they don't even bother to do nothing. They're dead already. Guys that have been shot in the leg, or they were wounded. They could still wounded. They hold on their shirt, shirt the leg. And they take care of those guys. But they got shot in the chest, and they knew that they didn't have a chance. When those bullets hit, the, the inside of your your flesh opens up, and when it goes out to the outside, the same thing with the outside. See, the, the bullet opens up when it hits the first part, then it goes outside, it hits the outside, the same thing. And you open up a big hole. And when it goes in, it goes in the little hole. And then the 30 caliber, just a little hole. And it got only just a hole, but inside, it opens up the flesh. You know? Because it's already going flat, you know. And I used to see a lot of guys that useless to even look at them. You, you couldn't do nothing to them. The guy was wounded right away. You called the paramedics because they had a lot of paramedics. And you know what they did when we were we didn't jump in Bamberg. We didn't jump in Bergman because they didn't have the. They didn't get the, the planes loaded with the equipment mm -hmm. and to put the, air, the, 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 the jumpers in there. So they loaded us in trucks to go help the guys in Bamberg. We went around like this on the road, and right in here was a big, giant hole about as big as this, this area here, real deep. And then when we went around the hole like this, we seen the uh, German trucks on the side of the cliff over here with machine guns. And then we saw in the, in the bottom of the hole, we seen some ambulance, American ambulance. You know one with the right or the Red Cross? About three or four of them down there. And then so the guys in the ambulance were being shot by the machine gun in the, in the cliff. They were shooting at the paramedics in there. That's why when we went around, 